Hello everyone! Welcome to my lecture on the subject Tilda Karum Hatnas Magneta Voinsha Practicum. According to our approved syllabus of our subject, today we will have a lecture on the theme Cross Cultural Negotiation. Let me introduce you with the plan of the lesson. Today we will have a Introduction material to cross-cultural negotiation research. You will have a general information about types of negotiations like integrative negotiation versus distributive negotiation. Also, you will get a brief knowledge about the four steps in the negotiation process. At last, you will get information about negotiating agreement. At the beginning, Let's start with the introduction to cross-cultural negotiation research. Let's take a look at cross-cultural negotiation. The art and skill of negotiation is something all professionals need to learn in order to succeed in their jobs and lives. All business takes place through communicating with people both inside and outside an organization. We must continually review information, assess situations, and make decisions. Another truth about business and other human interaction is that we're always negotiating with a variety of goals to get what we want, to motivate others, and to help others get what they want or to achieve mutual outcomes. All negotiation is intercultural. When any two people encounter each other, they always perceive, discover, and create reality from two different cultural perspectives. Intercultural negotiation is used in business because people who think, feel, and behave differently from one another have to reach agreements on the simple, practical, and complex activities involved. Cross-cultural differences, from language to context, social and systemic realities, can have dramatic effects in negotiation. While the differences are real and sometimes exaggerated in the moment, it's essential to remember that every person involved in cross-cultural negotiation is human and share concerns about their families and their lives. By focusing on your common humanity, you'll be able to more favorably connect with people in life and business. Let's begin by examining some background information and ideas that underline our need to learn cross-cultural negotiation. Conflict is a part of life, and ignoring conflict can be dangerous. Negotiation is used to handle differences in conflict, to create bridges where there are barriers, and to transact business in a global world. These negative experiences and perceptions do not mean we can stop negotiating. Numerous forces fuel us to keep at it and to learn to do it better. Global managers and acquisitions are increasing, and so are demands for skilled cross-cultural negotiators. Every merger, acquisition, or partnership requires relationship building, deal making, communication, and giving and taking. World trade is growing everywhere and shrinking the world through newly created relationships among people and between companies across a network of stakeholders. Negotiation training has been so urgently needed that Harvard University put together its Harvard Negotiation Project, the goal of which is to improve the theory and practice of conflict resolution and negotiation. Positional bargaining, our more traditional form of negotiation, is a kind of haggling process in which each side takes a position, argues for it, says it, what it will do and won't do, and makes mutual concessions to reach a compromise. The Harvard Negotiation Project advocates for the use of principled negotiation rather than positional bargaining. Principled negotiation or bargaining, on the other hand, is based on looking at the merits of issues and seeks mutual gains whenever possible. When the interests of the parties conflict, Harvard Negotiation Project insists that the result be based on fair standards independent of the will of either side. Negotiation almost always assumes some kind of conflict that may set up you and your opponent as adversaries. For example, you and the other party's goals or time frame may conflict. Your resources and context may differ. Your wants may appear to be mutually exclusive, but your real underlying needs are usually not the same. To some experts, negotiation is a basic means of getting what you want from someone. 
to others, it's a way to create mutually agreeable outcomes. Negotiation is communication designed to reach an agreement when you and the other side have some different interests. Negotiation is a field of knowledge and an activity in which you seek to gain the favor of people from whom you want things. The first question to ask is, what do you want? All people want a range of things at different times, and sometimes at the same time, including money, power, connection, justice, safety, meaning, friendship, recognition, or freedom. All people, no matter their culture, have wants and needs. We all have goals. We all want to achieve certain outcomes. In the negotiation process, we have two sets of needs, both the specific issues and demands that we state openly in negotiation and our underlying real needs, which are rarely verbalized and which negotiators tend to conceal. Negotiation is never just about the price or the product or service or money. Rather, it includes both the substance of the negotiation and the negotiation process itself. Negotiating is a way of acting and behavior that can either develop or destroy understanding, acceptance, respect, and trust in the negotiation process. The way you go about trying to negotiate is heavily influenced by culture. Negotiation is not about ultimatums or compromise. Rather, because you believe that people's goals can be mutually agreeable rather than exclusive, negotiation gives you an opportunity to create win-win outcomes. When this is the foundation, trust can be established and there can be real exchange of needs, feelings, and facts. Derived from the root words nig, or not, and odum, or ease, or leisure, you can see that, at its core, negotiation is not easy. In more modern terms, negotiation is typically described as a process of interaction between two or more parties with common and conflicting interests who want to reach agreement, preferably of mutual benefit. In win-win negotiation, both parties seek to realize the full benefit of their relationship by creating value through cooperation. Negotiation helps each party pursue its own interests and achieve those that are shared or complementary sometimes by expanding commonalities, sometimes by reconciling differences. Value is also claimed and competed over in a give and take of reaching a mutual agreement. People all over the world negotiate to get what they want. Negotiation is a skill that can be learned. Three crucial elements are always involved in every negotiation, information, time, and power. Information. The heart of negotiation. The more you have, the more you can understand others and others' needs. Time. A negotiation strategy tool. Most negotiation concessions happen near a deadline. Be patient and don't let deadlines drive your emotions and actions. Power. The capacity to get things done. Power is based on your perception. If you think you have it, you do, and if you don't think you have it, you don't. The ability to negotiate brings power to a negotiation. Negotiation, in short, means that you analyze information, time, and power in order to influence your environment and have mastery over your life. Both power and time are influenced by perception. If you think you have power, you have it. If you don't think you have it, you don't. Negotiation is a learned skill that can help bring you more self-confidence, power, and relationship effectiveness in order to meet yours and other people's needs and make things happen. As we seek to get what we want, negotiating along the way, we should also want to help others. All negotiation requires the understanding and use of information, power, and time. All negotiation also follows a standard process, starting with planning and ending with an agreement. All negotiations, whether domestic or cross-cultural, involve situations that require mutual understanding and clear communication from the involved parties who are both seeking to establish expectations and then work for their achievement. A compromise or settlement is often reached by narrowing down the differences and emphasizing the commonalities of interest among the parties. The negotiators must practice empathy appreciating the problems and limitations of the other side, as well as conflict management, time management, expectation management, and dispute resolution. Relationship building and cross-cultural negotiation requires more self-awareness, reflection, 
emotional and cultural intelligence and consensus perception of cultural difference than domestic ones. Successful cross-cultural negotiators familiarize themselves with styles and assumptions used in other cultures in order to anticipate moves and avoid missteps or misperceptions. In cross-cultural negotiation, the basic concept of the negotiation process varies, including the issues that are stressed and the protocol and communication styles that are used. Even the very nature of persuasive arguments differ. To succeed in cross-cultural negotiation, you must appreciate cultural differences and consistently endeavor to manage them. There are six major aspects involved in cross-cultural negotiation. First, there are human beings conducting the negotiation who have learned behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs that will affect the process. Second, each person has been raised, lived, or worked, or traveled in one or more national cultures. National background factors of cultural traditions and values, as well as political, economic, and social systems affect their culture. Third, the parties have goals that motivate them to enter the negotiation. Fourth, they may enter into a learned and socialized process of negotiation that involves communications and actions that may or may not be shared by the needs or co-created during the negotiation. Fifth, the negotiators seek outcomes individually and collectively. Six, the negotiation is conducted under specific conditions. Cross-cultural negotiation is highly influenced by background factors and atmosphere variables. Parties come to the negotiation with different objectives, which may be in common, conflicting, or complementary. Culture affects how negotiators view the negotiation process. They each bring values, beliefs, and backgrounds of their culture to the negotiating table and normally do so unconsciously. One of the more interesting and exciting areas of cultural difference in negotiation is that of personal behaviors, attitudes, and practices of the negotiators. Because negotiation rules vary by culture, each party brings unfamiliar and potentially conflicting expectations. People from different cultural backgrounds may never acknowledge the barriers they face in negotiating. As a result, the agreement may never be made. Intercultural negotiations fail because each person has a different concept of the process and may misinterpret the other's behavior. Even if two parties have similar tastes, the way that negotiation takes place is heavily influenced by national culture. Lack of attention to the other party's culture and negotiation style will negatively affect both process as well as outcome. Negotiation is more fruitful when the parties trust each other as it allows them to freely share information about their goals, interests, assumptions, and the barriers they see in negotiation. Sometimes there's too much emphasis on culture, which materializes as cultural stereotypes that manifest as excuses or rationales. In reality, people are complex. They don't always follow their cultural script. People in different cultures may have different definitions of success. The potential for misunderstanding in cross-cultural negotiation is high. The negotiation process may trigger an underlying matrix of cultural bias, beliefs, social expectations, and past experience. During the negotiation, you may be inadequately prepared, impatient, or ignorant of the other party's needs. You may become too emotional or too calculating. You may simply not listen well. You may also be ignoring the real conflict or problem involved with the issue at hand. Let's look for four key principles for conducting successful intercultural negotiation. More negotiations fail because of a break in the relationship, mistrust, or dislike between the persons involved than because of substantive differences. You can't separate people from the problem. Although doing so may seem logical, it can't really be done as long as the negotiation is between people. In traditional cultures in particular, trying to separate people from the issue of negotiation is detrimental. In a traditional negotiation process, each person usually takes a position on the situation or issue. He or she will argue for his or her own position. Each will then make concessions until a compromise is reached. 
in an innovative negotiation process, the parties will work together to reach an agreement that satisfies the key needs of both. Experience has shown that arguing over positions leads each party to look and lock to itself into its position. Many negotiations get stuck because of belief that there is only one pie and each party wants the whole thing. Yet many conflicts can be resolved by resorting to creative, untraditional solutions. Success at cross-cultural negotiation requires each party to see through the eyes of the other person sitting across the table and understand or attempt to understand their values, assumptions, and practice. Both parties must genuinely strive for mutual benefit and advantage throughout the process. Now, let's talk about types of negotiations like integrative negotiation and distributive negotiation. To give you a better idea of the distinction between the distributive and integrative approaches to negotiation, I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story. So let's imagine that you live in a world where, for some reason, there's a massive shortage of oranges, and you're sitting at home and find yourself really hanging out for a glass of freshly squeezed orange juice one day. So you decide to try your luck and you head to the supermarket, just on the off chance that there might be an orange left in the fruit section. You walk in the door, look over to the corner where the tray of oranges usually sit, and what do you happen to see? But one gleaming orange sitting there left in the tray. You quickly run over to the tray and reach out your hand to grab it, but just as you do that, someone else does the same thing. Now you're in a bit of a pickle. It's clear that both of you really, really want this orange, so you begin negotiating. Now, let's imagine first that you adopt a distributive approach to this negotiation, which is assuming basically that this is a competitive situation with a fixed amount of the orange for both of you, and your aim is to get as much for yourself as you possibly can. So you start off by saying to the negotiation partner, look, I've been hanging out for a glass of orange juice for months. I'll take 70% of this orange and pay 70% of the price. They say, no, 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 I really, really badly want this orange, so how about I pay 60% of the price and take 60% of the orange? This goes back and forth for a while with each of you competing for the best deal until you eventually settle on a 50-50 split. Each of you pays 50% of the price of the orange and gets half of the orange each. And then you go back to your house and you have your half a glass of freshly squeezed orange juice and it's reasonably satisfying, not too bad an outcome. But let's rewind and imagine instead that you adopt an integrative approach to negotiation. Remember that one of the key aspects of an integrative approach to negotiation is the assumption that the parties who are involved in the negotiation can actually have compatible interests. Both of you can walk away with the thing that you want and achieve a win-win result. So let's imagine if at the beginning of this negotiation, both of you just ask a simple question of each other. What is your interest here? Not your position, because we know that the initial position is that both of you want the orange, but what is your interest? What do you actually want to do with this orange and achieve with it? And you say, well, I want this orange so I can use the flesh to make a glass of freshly squeezed orange juice. And your partner says, well, I have no interest in the flesh. I actually just want to use the rind, the skin of the orange, to make orange muffins. This exchange of information between the two of you at the beginning of the negotiation drastically changes the potential solutions. It's pretty clear that what you can do now is each still pay 50-50 for the orange, which is the same as the result under the, dis the distributive approach. But instead of walking away with 50% of the flesh, you can walk away with 100% of it and make a much larger glass of orange juice. Similarly, your negotiation partner can get all of the skin and rind of the orange, not just half of it, and make many more orange muffins. This is a really, really basic example, but it's helpful in illustrating the point that 
an integrative approach to negotiation can often result in vastly superior negotiation outcomes. With its emphasis on assuming that win-win results are possible and inquiring and understanding your partner's interests, not just their initial position, the integrative approach gives us a better chance of arriving at negotiation outcomes and making joint decisions that have an overall higher benefit for everyone involved. Most negotiations feel like trench warfare. Two parties take a position, dig in, and battle it out. Let's say you're thinking of joining a startup, and you insist on receiving 5% equity in the company. But the founder only wants to give you 1%. So you go back and forth for days, trying not to give in. Your ego becomes identified with your 5% position. So you cling to your position and try not to give in because you don't want to look weak. Then, after a long, drawn-out negotiation process, you agree to meet in the middle, but neither party is really satisfied. Plus, the battle has fractured the relationship between you and the founder, which makes it difficult to work together. As the authors of Getting to Yes say, standard strategies for negotiation often leave people dissatisfied, worn out, or alienated, and frequently all three. In order to avoid long and bitter negotiations and preserve the relationships between you and the people you negotiate with, it's imperative that you learn and practice a set of negotiating principles from the classic negotiating guide, Getting to Yes. First, try on their point of view. Second, invent win-win agreements. And third, insist on using objective criteria. Your goal at the start of every negotiation is to transform the negotiation from a heated face-to-face -face battle to a side-by-side -side activity where both parties work together to solve the problem and create a win-win solution. Because when people feel involved in the creation of a solution, they're more likely to accept that solution. But this is hard because as the authors put it, the people you negotiate with have egos that are easily threatened. They see the world from their own personal vantage point and they frequently confuse their perceptions with reality. In the book, the authors provide a great example of this. When a negotiation between a tenant and a landlord breaks down, the tenant thinks the rent ought to be low because the neighborhood is run down. Well, the landlord thinks we landlords should raise rents to improve the quality of the neighborhood. When the tenant thinks I always pay my rent whenever she asks for it, the landlord thinks he never pays the rent until I ask for it. When the tenant thinks she is cold and distant, she never asks me how things are. The landlord is thinking I'm a considerate person who never intrudes on a tenant's privacy. If you can take time to understand the contrasting points of view in a negotiation, the person you're negotiating with will be less angry, offended, and hostile, and the more likely they are to join you in a side-by-side -side effort to create a mutually beneficial agreement. So before you enter negotiation, try on their point of view. Take time to go for a walk in the other person's shoes by imagining how they may have arrived at their current position and why they might be feeling pressure to hold their position. Maybe their boss is pressuring them to not compromise or maybe their wife is pressuring them to get the best deal possible. Once you think you have a good understanding of their perspective, say, let me see if I can summarize your position. You want A because of B, or you want X because of Y. If you're an office manager in a salary negotiation, you might summarize your employee's position by saying, let me see if I can summarize your position. You want to receive a higher raise than the standard 5% annual raise because you've hit all your annual targets and you feel like you're taking on harder projects than most people in the office. As you try to explain the other person's position in a way that satisfies them, you'll either notice that what they want is more reasonable and fair than you first thought, or as you explain it, they start to see that it doesn't make as much sense as they first thought. Hearing their position relayed back to them is almost like hearing their first draft read out loud and noticing the typos and grammatical errors. With some back and forth clarification, the two of you will reach a point where you'll be more inclined to work together to resolve any confusion and find a mutually beneficial solution rather than cling to original positions. Negotiation principle number two, invent a win-win agreement. A difference in perspective is the source of conflict, but it's also the source of many win-win agreements. I'll explain using a simple example. Say there's a lemon sitting on the kitchen counter and my wife and I are negotiating over who should get it. If we have the awareness to step back and ask, wait, what do you need this for? She might say, I need this for my recipe. And I might say, I need it because I want to add lemon juice to my water. At that moment, we realize that we can both get what we want. I only need the lemon juice, and she only needs the lemon zest for her recipe. 
So I zest the lemon, give her the zest, then juice the lemon, and we're both happy. As the authors say, a satisfactory agreement is made possible because each side wants different things. If you're starting a business and you care less about how much of the company you own and more about keeping your expenses low so the company will be successful, you'll quickly reach an agreement with an employee who thinks your business will be successful and cares more about equity than salary at this point. If a general manager of a professional basketball team is negotiating a new salary with his star player and the GM only wants to offer $10 million a year, but the player wants $13 million a year, both parties can reach an agreement based on different beliefs. If the player believes he's going to have a breakout year and the team is poised for a playoff run, but the owner is more conservative, the GM can offer a contract with the base salary of $10 million and a bonus of $3 million for every playoff series the team wins. That way, in the off chance the team does well, the extra revenue they make in the playoffs can offset the bonus. By leveraging the differences in perspective, both parties reached an agreement they were satisfied with. So to find an opportunity to create a win-win agreement, focus on how your interests, values, and beliefs differ from the person you're negotiating with. Negotiation principle number three, insist on using objective criteria. If you can't reach a mutually beneficial agreement, act like a judge and insist on using objective criteria to decide your case. Let's say you got in a car accident and totaled your car and an insurance adjuster only wants to give you $5,000 for your car, but you know it'll cost you at least $9,000 to buy a similar car. After one conversation with the insurance adjuster, you can tell he's trying to bully you and isn't interested in finding a mutually beneficial agreement. So you insist on using objective criteria to settle the disagreement. You find a fair market value for your car by finding three comparable cars that just sold in the used car market, by getting the standard blue book value for your car's model and year, and by finding out what a court might award you by talking to a lawyer or looking up public settlements. Then the next time you talk to the insurance adjuster, Say, I understand if you're bound to the company policy, but based on these examples, I believe I'm entitled to at least $8,500. Why don't you look over these documents and we'll talk sometime next week? Whatever he comes back with, insist on using objective criteria. Get in the habit of asking, what's your basis? Or how do you arrive at that figure? By insisting on using objective criteria to decide a negotiation, you let the other party know that they can't win simply by pressuring you. And that the only way that you'll reach an agreement is by agreeing on a standard with which you can settle the dispute. So if your negotiation reaches an impasse and you're feeling pressure to give in, get in the habit of asking, how would a court decide this? Research standards, existing precedent, cultural norms, fair market value, or a neutral third party expert that you'll both allow to settle the dispute. So the next time you enter a negotiation, prevent that negotiation from turning into a positional battle that resembles trench warfare and damages your relationship. And instead, try on their point of view, and then invite them to work with you to resolve the conflict. Then, try to invent a mutually beneficial agreement by focusing on your differences. And lastly, insist on using objective criteria, like existing precedent, professional standards, or cultural norms, to reach a fair agreement. That it's a turn to learn the four steps in the negotiation process. As you would have learned in our negotiation program, there are four steps to any negotiation. The first is preparation. In the preparation phase, as we're about to learn, 80% of our success will be in our ability to understand what exactly it is we want and how to prepare for our tradables, to prepare for what we're going to ask for, what we're going to do, if the other side throws us a curveball, and how to go into that discussion with all of the uh, ammunition that we need. The second step is to probe, at which point we are interested in finding out more about what the other person wants, what they're thinking, perhaps why they want it. We're not telling them too much about what we want, but rather we're interested in learning more about them. The third step is the propose phase and this is when we then having had their information provided to us propose what we're thinking. In other words, are we close? Are we some way apart? And in, in this propose phase we go backwards and forwards and we are going to uh, bargain, perhaps trade concessions, 
maybe compromise a little bit in order to get what we want. And in the final step, we are going to pack up. Once we've reached an agreement, we make sure that the agreement is going to stick. So let's take some time and look at these four phases. Step number one is preparation. So in the preparation phase, the first thing to do is to set your objectives. What is it that you want to achieve? You, you need to know what is the main reason you're negotiating and what is the main thing that you want. For example, let's imagine you're buying a home. Well, your main objective might be to buy the home. A sub-objective might be the terms. Did you want a 30-day settlement, a 60-day settlement, or a 120-day settlement? Ultimately, you may not be able to change the settlement time, but have you been able to purchase the house? So therefore, what is your main objective? The second thing I'm going to do is identify my interests. In other words, do I have any long-term interests in coming to an agreement in this negotiation? For example, if I'm buying something and it's a one-off purchase and I'm never going to see this person ever again, then I really have no long-term interests as such. Therefore, I might use a different style of negotiation when I negotiate. For example, I'm probably go, going to go in a little bit harder. Why? I have no long-term interests. Once this is over, I'm, I'm never going to see this person ever again. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to be rude or obnoxious or I'm going to be uh, unethical, but it means I have no long-term interests. On the other hand, if I'm negotiating with a very good client, and this is a, a long-term client, then it means that my interests outweigh my position. What are the precedents for this negotiation? For example, has a similar negotiation ever been conducted before? What was the outcome? Uh, once again, let's use the example of purchasing a home. How much does a similar home in a similar area currently sell for? You see, there's no point me trying to sell my home for a million dollars, for example, if the very best home in the street has sold for 750000 not unless there is a special reason why my home is worth $250,000 more. Likewise, if I am buying a home, I want to find out what the going rate is. Is the vendor offering a fair price? Is it market rates? If the vendor is trying to sell it for more, I want to know why. Uh, for example, um, if I have to put my price up and, and explain that to one of my clients, I need to uh, help him or her understand the precedence for doing that. For example, um, is the dollar going higher or lower? Have um, the price of uh, using our trainers gone up? Are there other costs involved that I need to let them know about? And now I want to create a series of tradables. What is it I'm going to trade and concede on in order to get what I want? As we would have learned in our training, there are three tradables, time, money, and the specifications. Generally, when one of these is more sensitive, it means there is more leeway to the other two. For example, if a customer says to me, I only have $4,000 to spend on training. That's it. And for example, let's imagine my training is more than that. Well, what do I do? I could say, sorry, I can't uh, give you what you want. Well, that would be short-sighted, wouldn't it? Alternatively, I could look at money, uh, or pardon me, I could look at time and I could look at specifications. For example, if money is the area where the other person is least negotiable, what about time? For example, could I offer to do this course at a time that suits me and not a time that suits them? What about if I change the specifications? For example, I could provide this training for a cheaper rate. However, 
I will give you a half day, not a full day. Or, we'll finish at 3 o'clock, not 5 o'clock. Or, I will use another trainer to do the course. It'll still be a very good course, but you won't be able to have me come and do it because my fee is more than what you're wanting to spend. Or, maybe you pay up front or maybe you give me five referrals afterwards. In other words, I'm thinking of all the things that I might want if I was to reduce my price to a point which made them somewhat uh, happy with the result. In other words, the purpose of negotiating is to get to a point where both parties feel like they've won, and the way we do that is by trading concessions. The next thing I have to do once I know exactly what it is I have to trade is to set my limits. What is the very most I'm going to ask for? What is the very least I will accept and still call this a win? This is called the bargaining zone. For example, um, let's imagine I want to purchase a second-hand car. Well, the most I uh, am prepared to uh, spend is $10,000. I probably don't have uh, a bottom end because uh, who knows I might pick myself up a bargain but what I know is when I go and do some shopping for a used car the very most is $10,000. Therefore anything above that is not in my bargaining zone. I now set some limits. In this case, let's imagine that I was uh, purchasing maybe some something uh, of around the uh, $20,000 uh, price tag. For example, let's say it was some uh, some some music equipment. Well, the very most I want to sell my musical equipment for is around $23,000. So um, that's what I want. $22,990. That's what I believe it's worth. The valuation is much higher and uh, I believe I can justify that to the person I'm negotiating with. However, the very least I'm prepared to accept is $18,500. Anything between that range is a win. Anything less than 18,490 is a lose. So this is my win zone. What I need to then do is create a BATNA. What is my fallback position? In other words, what am I going to do if I cannot get the very minimum I'm wanting? A BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And the BATNA is what I do if I can't get my lowest price. Now, what is my BATNA? Let's imagine I was selling some musical equipment. Well, uh, what are my possibilities? Could I sell it to someone else? Could I re-advertise it? Could I keep it? Could I perhaps sell it in stages? Maybe I have 10 pieces of equipment and I can sell two pieces at a time. Or maybe I sell the most expensive for uh, 12000 and then the rest for smaller amounts. So here's the thing. The BATNA is going to determine what you do. Let's imagine someone was heading overseas and had a car to sell. And they were leaving next Friday. They'd never come back to the country again. Therefore they have a very bad fallback position because they're going to leave. So what will happen if they can't sell the car? Well, do they have a friend they could sell it to or they could give it to? Do they know someone who would sell it on their behalf? If they do, then that might be their alternative. If they have no alternative, then what might happen is they might have to take a price which is lower than what they really wanted. The most important question to ask is what will you do if you can't get the minimum that you want from your negotiation?
And if you have some alternatives, if indeed there are some things that you could do, then you have a strong BATNA. Too often people give away too much or give in too soon by not having a BATNA. What is the best alternative? So it's always important to know what you'll do if you can't get your minimum. Finally, before I go to negotiate, I'm going to create a series of what-if scenarios. In other words, I'm going to sit down and think about all the possibilities that could occur during the, nego the negotiation. What if they tell me that they're going to be discussing the sale of this product or the purchase of this product with my main competitor? What if they try and lowball me? What if they come back to me and want to pay over 90 days, not 7 days? In reality, you could have hundreds of what-if scenarios. However, your best judgment should tell you what is going to be pretty typical of this type of negotiation. And of course, the more negotiating that you do, the greater chance you'll have of developing these scenarios so you know what to expect. The reason I want to prepare these what-if scenarios is so that if these things do occur, and many of them might, I know how to prepare myself and I know my counter-argument. I simply draw up a piece of paper and on one side I have what if and on the other side I have what I'm going to do if they ask that question or if this argument comes up.